So more recently, I was a field investigator for the DSM-5. Um, you guys who don't live in America don't have to use the DSM-5. That's our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. I think it's only in America and like Angola or something like this. Um, thank goodness for insurance purposes, we use the ICD-10. We have many more options. And there's a company out of Spain. I don't know if any of you heard of a company called Nesplora. And they created a virtual reality um, measure of attention, working memory, executive function. Anyway, I was part of that, collecting U.S. norms. So that was really fun because it's an Oculus headset. And uh, the kids really like that, the adults like that. And I can now measure my memory and see how it's going as I'm aging. <laughs> um, so, yes, this goes, I'm just using, I'll try this because this one I'm, oh, that doesn't want to work, does it? I'm just supposed to click on the right arrow, is that correct? I did. I'll try up, down, left. Everybody had a problem getting this started. Where did... Ta-da! Um, so I am here. I don't know how to get rid of that little thing. Um, to talk about executive dysfunction, I guess I would say. Um, because, yes, I personally have it. Well, yes, I've touched every one of those 1,600 kids, but I have psychometrists that work for me. That's how I was able to do that many. So um, although I'm invi involved in part of the testing all of the time. So executive functions are um, cognitive processes that allow us to attain our goals. Okay, it didn't work before. But I clicked it enough, and then I got it. Okay. I don't know how I got it before. It's not working now. Let's use this. Batteries. Yeah, where should we point it? <laughs> Probably back there. Yeah. That would be Okay. Um, they facilitate our ability to attain goals, to set goals, um, and they're associated with regions in the brain that have to do with learning and emotional control. These are all prefrontal lobe, frontal lobe functions. Um, and fMRI research, which I find fascinating, so you're in an MRI but doing a function, right? They see differences in the frontal lobe, prefrontal lobes, in um, in this area with people with particularly with executive dysfunction such as ADHD or autism. And it sounds funny, but it's uh, kind of underactivated. The frontal lobes are less active if you ever worked with or know ADHD people. It looks like it's overly activated, but it's not. Um, let's see, oh, look at this. So there are also symptoms of many, many disorders. So um, I'm gonna in particular focus on attention deficit and autism spectrum. I do testing for both of those as well as dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia. Um, you don't need to do testing for emotional disorders. <laughs> Any good clinician can figure that out, right? Um, and you know, there's also traumatic brain injury, mood disorders, stroke, Parkinson's, epilepsy, dementia. You guys could probably tell me even more. Um, how many of you are clinicians? Okay, uh, okay, that's you are too. You're a clinician. Is that the wrong word? How many of you work with clients? There we go. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so there's, it depends who, which researcher you follow, how many, um, this is theoretical, right? We can't measure executive functions in the brain, but you know, the, 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 from my experience working with them, I'm gonna say there's 12 of them and we're gonna go through 12 of these, okay? And so, it's, um, so I have an executive function coaching program also. And um, so it is amazing how just a little bit of dysfunction in one area or all of those areas can really sidetrack somebody's life and their goals. And it's hard for me during a feedback when I'm sitting with the parents for two hours, going over the 30 page report of the diagnoses to help them understand like this is impairing. It's just not that your boy has blue eyes and blonde hair and by the way, ADHD. You know, it's a diagnosis in a variety of manuals. It's impairing. And it's funny, they'll come back to me sometimes and say, I talked to him about planning and he still can't plan. <laughs> and I'm like, well, would you fix a broken toaster with a broken toaster? because <laughs> somehow they think you can kind of talk their way through all this. And there's some truth in that when the brain matures. 
um, because some of the uh, more recent research shows that the frontal lobes don't actually form all their neural pathways until about mid-20s. So there is no teenage brain like an adult brain. And the NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health, had a 10-year longitudinal study and found that the frontal lobe of people with ADHD matures anywhere from three to five years behind their same age peers. So those are critical periods. You're in college and you're 19, going on 16, right? Or you're getting your first job, you're 25, going on 20, depending on the day uh, that you're doing. And so these aren't things to be overlooked and just minimized with a client. Um, and, and I believe, you know, knowledge is power. I want them to understand in many ways what types of things they're dealing with. So otherwise they have this general sense that I'm a failure. I'm a schmuck. That's a slang word. You guys know what that means for people who aren't from the U.S.? I'll try not to use slang words. Um, <laughs> Oh, sorry, this is what I was talking about. So yes, even a minimal degree of dysfunction in a few areas can cause a person to struggle in all aspects of life and can persist over a lifetime. So the first one is goal-setting persistence. The capacity to set a goal, follow it through completion, not be put off or distracted. This is big picture, okay? We all have goals. We had a goal to come here. Just think how many steps it took to do that. Right? There was this big picture. I'm going to talk about a fictitious client. I'm going to call her Allison. She is 20. Uh, she had straight A's in high school. <clears throat> she got into a, a college, university, and in the honors program, which means that she's living with other students that are uh, bright and they have special classes. And uh, she has a current diagnosis of ADHD, autism, she had uh, major depression, eating disorders, those are all better. And um, off she goes with this long range goal to graduate college. So now we're gonna talk about the day in, day out things that have to happen to attain a goal. First, you have to prioritize. The ability to, to make a decision about what is and what is not important and focus on currently, both in the near future and the far future. We did a lot of prioritizing for everybody out there who's going to make a, give a presentation, right? When do we start? How long is it going to take? Is it more important than this other thing that we need to do? Um, then, here's a real problem for people. How to get started. Task initiation, the ability to begin projects without undue procrastination in an efficient manner. So the opposite of this is procrastination. So when I do an intake, I'll often ask the parents, uh, does your child have an A in procrastination? It's the best grade you can get. And they're like, yes, <laughs> because they can't get started. Um, one of my, I have three sons. One of my sons was both dyslexic and ADHD. And one of the ways to help somebody with procrastination is to um, kind of teach them a really simple cognitive technique. And I'll ask them, you can do anything for 20 minutes, right? Almost anything. And some will be like, no. I'm like, okay, how long? 10 minutes. I'm like, great. You're going to take your phone, set the timer for 10 minutes, turn it upside down, and you only have to do blank for 10 minutes. Study, balance your checkbook, work with your taxes. And then you, the timer goes off. You set it for another five minutes. Make sure you set it. And then you do it again. Because in their minds... They can say, yes, I can do anything for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. This, this, if they cannot get started, this continues to negatively impact everything. So they have to have a plan. This is both daily and long term. The ability to create and maintain systems to keep track of information or mater materials. The ability to create and follow a roadmap to reach a goal or complete a task. It involves setting goals, developing a sequence of steps, and organizing activities to accomplish the goal. Um, we do this all the time. Then we wake up this morning and we went to bed last night and say, what time do we have to get up? You know, what's our plan? How long is it going to take us? Um, what do we have to do? To we all had a plan. I haven't met anybody from Spain yet. How to get here, how long that's going to take, when we get started on that, what do we have to have done before that? Um, 
I have a son in Amsterdam, so I got to go there first. And so I had a big suitcase, and I had a little suitcase, and I had a plan. The little suitcase was for here. What am I putting in the big suitcase? What am I putting in the little suitcase? That was going to make it easier for me in the long run, which means, ideally, you need some organization, right? The ability to create and maintain systems to keep track of information or materials. So to go back to Allison, she had this plan to graduate from college, right? Um, I will tell you in the first semester, so right away I knew she needed coaching because she got through high school with straight A's because high school in America is very structured. You show up five days a week, you go to school, people know who you are, they know if you're not turning things in, everybody around you is doing the same thing. You go to college, and if you're taking 15 hours, you only go to school 15 hours that week. And I knew that she was going to struggle. So I have, a, um, uh, I have executive function coaches. So our, my coaching program starts with an hour-long intake of, with the, the client. Or if it's a college student, I say the client and the paying party, <laughs> which is the parents. We talk to them 15 minutes a day, five times a week. There is no possible way you can help executive functioning talking to them once a week. That's called therapy. And if you think you can, you cannot. And you will be surprised how they struggle with all of that. My coaches start with sleep. Nothing can happen without prioritizing, back to prioritizing, a sleep schedule, right? And then they help them keep track of what they have to do the next day. They don't know how to organize what they're going to do. They don't know how to plan what they're going to do, how they're going to break it down. We're only spending 10 to 15 minutes each one of those five days a week. Sometimes, of course, it's 20 or 30, and some days it's two minutes, depending on them. But they have a very hard time organizing, she had a very hard time, organizing her classes, her assignments, her backpack. You can kind of tell some of this. You might be married to somebody like this. Not that I know anything about that. And there's just stuff all over, and there's no systems, right? When we first married, um, I made this deal that I was going to organize the bills, he was going to pay the bills, and then I was going to organize them again on the last end, filing them. It helps to know this about your spouse. Otherwise, you might accuse them of something that's not true. <laughs> um, and so now we've set our path. She's decided that she's going to um, use this coach, try to get organized. Um, the, and we're talking day in, day out. What do you have to do today? What's due on Thursday? What are your steps today? Where's your plan? Uh, do you know how to get on the college website and find these things? They often do not know how to do this. Halfway into the semester, she's failing four out of five of her classes. She, even though she has a coach, she can't follow through. She has a plan. She can't prioritize. And she can't keep attention on the goal. You don't attain goals all at once. It's a moment-by-moment -moment decision. So everybody thinks ADHD is just about attention. I wish that were true. The name is so wrong, by the way. I don't like the name. Um, even when I diagnose it, I tell the parents it's all wrong. Um, just Let's just start with the first part of that, attention deficit. There is no deficit in any of these things. It's incredibly variable and inconsistent. If they like it, they can pay attention, they can remember, they can focus, they can plan more successfully than if they don't. Why? Because if we like something, our brain activates. And we can, again, see these sort of things. And so they're doing something they like, and their brain activates to some sort of kind of normal level. And then they do something they don't like, and their brain does not turn on for them. This is really what separates somebody with and without ADHD. It's not the things we like. It's the boring things we don't like. Taxes, cleaning. You have to be able to um, get your, if you're not ADHD, your brain just, you're like, it's time to do it. You sit down and your brain goes, okay, I'm paying attention. It's really, that's a really important distinction for people who are ADHD because they thought everybody was struggling with it and they were just bad at it. You know, versus like, if you're good at all these things, you don't get any pats on your back. Your brain just does that. You don't have to put any effort in. These people have to put a lot of effort into being able to pay, pay attention, focus, 
and and you know s sit down and and do these sort of things right so this requires day in day out and this is a really difficult thing for our youth now uh, somebody was talking about the mental health crisis in children and there's been a, a lot of research that i've shown since the advent of smartphones in 2012 and 2013 uh, we have a, a, a huge exponential rise in suicidality, um, cutting, depression, because we've never had access to the whole planet. And just think when you're still forming your identity and all you do is compare yourself to people that aren't real or altered their appearance or only talk about the good things that they're doing. And you have access to that all the time. So it's really easy to not pay attention. Um, I was talking with Benjamin out there about learning, and there's a lot of online learning, right? That has not worked for me, and I don't even have ADHD. But I'm learning something online, and it gets boring. But this tab over here is open. Oh, yeah, and this tab's open over there, right? Oh, I should check my work email, right? I've, I've outruled that in my life. That's not happening. No more of those. And it's also just not engaging enough for me to really learn something. So these kids have a really hard time paying attention. They don't have a deficit. It's most consistently variable. They have a modulation problem. It's consistently inconsistent. And the other part of that disorder, the first name, attention, I wish that's all there was. And I tell parents, that's that, especially as you get older, that is not your problem. Your problem is these executive functions. Again, planning, organizing, strategizing, working memory. And again, it's not that they don't have it. It's not a deficit. It's that it's inconsistent and variable. The second half of that disorder, hyperactivity, parents hate that term. I wish they just said overly active, right? They don't have to be in trouble. They do not have to be in trouble to be overly active. Impulsivity, that's a key feature. You know, they do things without thinking. They suffer a lot of consequences. I have a so I do testing, but I also do therapy. And I have a 14-year-old um, a boy I'm working with who, who I diagnosed with ADHD about three years ago. <laughs> and uh, recently, he, uh, uh, his parents weren't home out during the day and wrapped it around a telephone pole. And it was the car he was going to get to use, right? Um, he didn't have a pause button. He was impulsive. Everybody was gone. Seemed like a good idea. He had his permit. And that was a very impulsive act. The police came, which is going to have big consequences for him in his life. Um, the, my client, who is on the spectrum also, autism spectrum disorder, struggled uh, primarily with social emotional reciprocity, right? So she didn't have any friends during high school. Um, people regard, regarded her as kind of different and odd. She goes to college and now she's not so different and odd. So she has a lot of friends that are inviting her places. She has, she's very pretty. She has a lot of boys that are very interested in her. She is all over the campus. I can't count how many people she's had sex with yet <laughs> because she's very impulsive. I mean, luckily, she's starting to feel bad about that. <laughs> Right? It doesn't cross her mind. This could be dangerous. Uh, we made a pl pact that she's always going to tell me the truth. You know, patients tell you that, but they don't. But the beauty of working with somebody on the spectrum is they tell you the truth. They're black and white. All right? And then I can tell her the truth back. Like, I don't think going to this hotel room was a great idea that you met with this guy on there. Right? So impulsivity is a key feature. And again, that, so that name, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, should be called... Uh, modulation and variability disorder, but then nobody would understand it probably whatsoever. But that's really the problem. It's not, it's a, attention is a problem with little kids, right? By the time you're hitting middle school, so we're talking 11, 12, 13, that's not so much a problem anymore. In America, you now have five or six different classes you're going to each day, five or six different teachers different deadlines, different books. It's not all one nice class. And this is where we start to see a lot of maybe brighter, undiagnosed ADHD people show up with a diagnosis because they were fine in elementary school and suddenly they're failing everything because of executive dysfunction. So you have to be able to stay focused on um, your what the tasks that you need to do, but you also have to be able to control your own thoughts. This is also where therapy comes in handy, right? So you've sat down 
to work on this project or study something and you're not clicking on your phone and you're not clicking on different tabs but you're starting to think about she's starting to think about this guy did she really catch feelings for this guy and then this other guy's also kind of coming into her head and one of her girlfriends kind of left her out of something that they were all doing a few days ago and um, oops what's her mom gonna say when they see you know her thoughts are just all over the ability I'm sure we've all recognized this in ourselves. We sit down to do something and like, get ready for this, right? So this is mostly a thought process. You have to have a plan, you have to be organized. You sit down to do it. Next thing you're thinking about something that you don't have to you know, spend so much energy on. And you're like, wait, I need to go back to this thing I was doing and keep my thought process where to reach my current goals. And again, success is not made all of a sudden. It's a moment by moment, day by day decision process. Um, and that's how you graduate from college. That's how you get to where you want to get to in your life. It's a day in, day out. This is why we do executive coaching so frequently because it doesn't work to do it less frequently. They're dealing with these things all the time, constantly. Um, and so here's behavior inhibition, the ability to inhibit one's own actions or responses. This includes self-control and the ability to delay gratification. So this is also known as impulsivity, right? Uh, it starts in your head, and then next thing you know, she was going to study, but she hears a bunch of people walking down the hall, and she gets up almost without thinking and goes out there to see what's going on. This is a cute picture because you can see everybody in the background is crazy, wild, fun, you know, can it maybe sometimes doing things you don't do, uh, you shouldn't do. But can you stop those behaviors? Um, so this is a kind of a uniquely American statement. So I hope it makes sense. Um, we kind of say in America that there's a gaydar, like the people that might be homosexual can know who the other ones are. Um, I have a son who's gay, so he says that's really true. Um, I think there's an ADHR because <laughs> my ADHD son found all the other kids like that to play with. Um, I don't know if you've studied or heard Russell Barkley. He does a ton of research in Massachusetts. And he estimates that up to 60% of prisoners are undiagnosed ADHD. So you can see how that happens because you don't get the proper help. You don't even understand what's going on. School's boring because you're not interested in it. And then there's this other person over there that's kind of like you. So let's sneak out. Let's sneak out of school. Let's go do this together. Um, let's drink. Oh, this car is sitting here. I mean, this escalates in time. The keys are in it. Let's jump in it. Let's steal a car, right? Behavior inhibition can be a real problem because there's no pause button to decide what to do. And, you know, I, I tell parents all the time, do not ask your kid above the age of 10, why did you do that? First of all, they have no idea because there wasn't a pause button. <laughs> and also, if we think about when abstract develops, if we follow brain models, it's not at age 10. You know, this is also why, you know, I personally am kind of like Russell Barkley. I don't do therapy with the kid till they're 11. Because otherwise, I tell the parents, I'm, I will work with you. But otherwise, I'm just taking your money. Because they're not going to sit there next Tuesday and go, oh, Dr. Danielle said on Monday that I should do this <laughs> when I feel like this. Um, I can help the school. I can help the parents. Uh, as the kids get older, it's totally different. Then we can help them understand these things. Um, so impulsivity is when you just join in without kind of thinking. This unfortunately is a huge deficit in autism. Flexibility, the ability to revise plans, face obstacles, setbacks, deal with new information or mistakes. Um, it relates to adaptability to changing conditions when something unexpected or unpredicted happens. They have a very difficult time if things don't go the way they thought it was going to go. I'm going I'm to go off topic for a second. Um, I've been in practice for a while. You could tell when she said that. And 10 years ago, we did not have the instruments I have now to make a diagnosis of autism. And I am certain that I misdiagnosed some children with anxiety disorders and ADHD social skills problems. And then as more and more of these instruments came out and I got more and more training, I'm like, whoa, okay, here's this. And it became more and more evident 
as they got older. I mean, granted, the zero to three are getting picked up early. That's not the level walking into my practice. They're high functioning. And so I luckily had people come back for a reval. And at this point, they're having a lot of struggles with social connections. They're regarded as odd and different. They, flexibility is a big problem at home. If they said they were going to this restaurant at six, the parents decide to go to another restaurant, they have a meltdown. They cannot handle plan B. How many of us are on plan A in our long-term goal? I'm not. I'm on plan B. I love it. Good thing plan A didn't work out, right, kind of thing. This is where negative emotions come in handy. Continual negative emotions are signs, guides. We like to say, I like to say, like, you know, we have Native Americans. They were very intuitive guides that said, ooh, why am I having this emotion over and over? Oh, yeah, I hate this job. <laughs> I should probably do something different, you know? Um, and so they really struggle with flexibility. Um, when the kids are younger and still living at home, I try to give the parents games they can play. We're just going to teach your kid how to be flexible. It's going to happen around 5.30. We're not going to tell you what. It's very difficult for them to learn to be flexible. All of us, now we have this plan, we're trying to get here, we're making up our slide presentation, oh, we don't like this, or we don't like that. And we have to be flexible, right? Your plane gets delayed. Um, you didn't get the seat you wanted. Flexibility happens all the time to revise our plans. Um, um, you were talking about, you know, 30, 45. Like, what am I doing? Is this my life? You know, is there flexibility then at that point to change careers? to kind of ask yourself the question, what should I do differently? And she struggles a great deal with any kind of flexibility. Um, if some friend says they're going to go do something and they change, she goes through all kinds of self-loathing. And this is where I think therapy and understanding diagnosis can be useful because I'll just say, oh, that's just flexibility. That's all. It's just very hard for you if there's a change you didn't anticipate. But that's really not you. That's just your autism. You're not your autism. Let's just figure out who you are and go from there. You're not your ADHD, but it helps them a great deal because they've just internalized everything and they just think they're terrible failures across the board. And then she would know, hopefully, a hundred times later that if something doesn't go to plan, she'll be able to go, oh, yeah, this is flexibility. What do I do now? What do I do with all the feelings? This is what happens when there's a big change they didn't expect. They have feelings that can be Debilitating, debilitating, which they can't control. Time management. <laughs> this is a can be a struggle for lots of people, right? Uh, it's particularly a struggle, however, if you have ADHD. They're late often, and they're late with their assignments. They're they're late with even things they like, right? They don't they don't understand how long it's going to take. My son, um, who has ADHD, who's thirty now. Um, he would, he was raised by me. So I would give him these words. I wanted him to understand what the processes were in his brain that he had to learn to do differently. Unfortunately for him, he has a fraternal twin brother who doesn't have this. And then I have another boy, a year and a half younger, who doesn't have it. Uh, that was kind of a great thing as a psychologist. <laughs> I could see like, wow. Talk about brain differences, same parents, same sex, almost born at the same time. And this guy, you know, another American slang term, got the short stick. He didn't ask for this. And so time management. Um, so the capacity to, est to est estimate how much time one has, how to allocate it, how to stay within time limits and deadlines, a sense that time is important and passing. He was working on a paper once in my on my first floor, ADHD kids would not be in their bedroom studying alone. I, I postulate nobody should. Are you going to learn more right here or sitting alone looking at your computer? When you're in college, did you learn more in your dorm room or in the library? So I walk by him. I say, what you doing? Working on a paper. I said, how long do you think that's going to take you? He said, 30 minutes. I said, oh, remember how ADHD can make it take longer? Not you. Right? Why don't you just say 60? You know, understanding the ability to, to have a, uh, understand how time passes. My coaches, the kids hate this. We start with a written calendar. 
not on your phone, not in your head, not the college calendar. They can't even, we start with estimating how long it takes them to get ready in the morning. First task, they totally underestimate how much time it takes to get ready, right? And so they're always late to things. The ability to manage time uh, might be easy again for all of you who don't have these challenges. It might just come naturally. But for these people, it's really difficult. In fact, I put myself a note, what time is it, so that I <laughs> don't talk too long, <laughs> right? What'd you say? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, that's too bad because this is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> Working memory. Working memory is precedes all types of memory. If you cannot hold in your working memory, you will not get in your short term. You won't get in your intermediate. So again, it's a frontal lobe function and it is a deficit. Where did you put your phone? Where did you put your backpack? What were you just going to say? Why did you walk into your bedroom? What if you're in a learning environment and your working memory is not Velcro? Your working memory is a colander, right? So this stuff is falling out all the time. You can't get it into your short-term memory if it never stuck in your working memory. We can measure this. I can measure it visually and verbally and all kinds of different ways. And then you have to be able to regulate how you feel. Again, the frontal lobe is our master CEO, if you will. So it also controls emotional regulation. At any given time, about 60% of kids with ADHD can have a concurrent mood disorder. Well, the general population in America is at about 25%. Because if this part of the brain doesn't regulate things well, it's not all these other things I just talked about, it doesn't regulate that well, and it doesn't regulate emotions. I think these, this is my opinion, are the top four executive functioning deficits. Um, getting started, uh, well, number one, working memory, then getting started, and then planning, and then flexibility. And so, um, Getting started begins with everything, right? So this is some of my techniques is, you know, a 20 minute rule. Um, don't let yourself do one of your favorite things until you finish this 20 minute thing. I'm sure you've all heard of this idea. If you don't like to exercise, only watch your favorite show on the treadmill, only there. <laughs> so you don't care about the treadmill. You care about your favorite show, right? Um, make the environment. That can be helpful. You're doing homework. You hate it. Put some music on in the background, some candles, some lights. You gotta get started, even if it's for 20 minutes. During that process, you have to remember what you're doing. Working memory is a little bit easier now with phones if they remember to use them. We have great calendar systems on our phones, right? You can record a meeting. You can record a lecture. Um, you can verbally remind yourself, okay, I'm walking to the bedroom to get this. I'm walking to the bedroom to get this. That sounds dumb, but it's really helpful because they, get, they forget what they're doing. I saw my son, okay, he was seven. These mo morning boring things that you have to do. I tell the parents their name, 10 words or less in a monotone voice, six times, monotone voice. This is not their fault. So I had looked right at him, I said, Nick shoes. I was down to two words. The shoes were in the garage, which was about seven steps away. He walked out there, that's where the coats were. He came back in with his coat, on and his stocking feet. That was working memory. In that short a time, he lost what he was doing. I said, good job, now it's time for your shoes. Working memory is big, really big. Um, planning, organizing. So now you have your long-term goal. How are you gonna get ready for this You know, day in, day out? So seeing it is better than thinking about it. Paper, whiteboard, steps, outlines, dates. And then phew, something goes wrong. You have to be flexible to change everything. Did I, did I get two minutes? <laughs> and that was my last slide, and I don't have. Thank you for paying attention. I'll just say it. <laughs>